What if the Bible's most terrifying tale is the key to understanding all that once unfolded daily here at Judaism's most sacred site? And what if that story's central lesson, often overlooked, still reverberates in our religion today, but less in fear than in reverence and awe? In the 1950s, a remarkable exchange took place between two clergymen, respectively representing two very different faiths. A Roman Catholic priest in Boston by the name of Reverend James Walsh was intrigued by a Jewish ritual involving parents and children, the Pidyon Haben, in which the father of a firstborn son, a month following the baby's birth, presents the child to a Kohen, a descendant of Aaron. The parent then redeems the child with several silver coins given to the Kohen, and the child is returned to him. Reverend Walsh wrote to Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik inquiring about the ritual, asking the rabbi how Jews perform it today and what exactly is its spiritual symbolism and significance. The rabbi, of course, could have ignored the inquiry or penned a rote response, but that is not what he chose to do. Instead, Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote in return a treatise not only on the ritual, but about Jewish religion itself. The key to the parental redemption, he argued, can be found in an agonizing Abrahamic tale, one known to the priest as much as the rabbi. Few scriptural stories are as frightening as that known as the Akedah, or the sacrifice of Isaac, which begins with the Bible's haunting words. And it was after these events that the Lord tested Abraham, saying, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Abraham, as we know, obeyed, set straight off for Mount Moriah with his son. And as they ascended the mount, Isaac inquired as to the absence of the animal. Behold, he says, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the sheep? for an offering. Abraham, in reply, hints to him all that is about to unfold. Elohim yiraloha selo ola b'ni, he says. The Lord will show us the land, my son. The scene has been captured by Rembrandt in a heartbreakingly beautiful and insightful etching. As Abraham speaks in the image, one hand points to heaven as he makes mention of the Almighty, but the other clutches his heart, indicating for the artist that these words spoken by Abraham also embody plaintive prayer that God will indeed show him the sheep, that Isaac's life will be saved. Only after Isaac has been bound to this altar was this prayer fulfilled, and an angel appeared to Abraham, and a ram revealed as redemption for Isaac, an animal offered in the beloved son's stead. This moment marks the mount as an eternally sacred site, one where Abraham was answered. There, God showed him the sheep. There, the ram was revealed. Christians, of course, as Rabbi Soloveitchik knew well, saw this story as prefiguring what they believed to be the central event in the founding of their own faith. But Jews, Rabbi Soloveitchik explained to Reverend Walsh, understand this story that took place on Mount Moriah as obligating every aspect of our own lives. At the heart of the Jewish worldview, Rabbi Soloveitchik suggested, is the belief in the absolute ownership of the divine, of all that we have. Man is merely, in Rabbi Soloveitchik's words, a guardian in whose care the works of God have been placed as a precious charge. In other words, our very lives are not ours. We have them by God's grace. And this is also true of lives more precious to us than our own. Children, Rabbi Soloveitchik wrote, are the greatest and most precious charge God has entrusted to man's custody. But, he went on to explain, like all else in life, our children belong to God. The Akedah, he suggested, must be understood in this context. For Abraham to deserve fatherhood, he had to prove his acceptance of this theological truth and acknowledge that he, as a father, was a custodian of the child for whom he had longed and that therefore he understood that with parenthood came obligation. God for Rabbi Soloveitchik ultimately sought not the physical sacrifice of Isaac, but rather the renouncement by Abraham of personal possession of the child. 
The Almighty's intended result at the Akedah was not Isaac's death, but rather Abraham's recognition of the true nature of parenthood, how it obligates us to sanctify our children's lives. That, Rabbi Soloveitchik concludes, is precisely what is recognized by Jewish parents throughout the generations in the redemption ritual that so piqued the curiosity of the Catholic priest. He writes as follows. The ceremonial of redemption of the firstborn son reenacts the drama of Abraham offering Isaac to the Lord. The father of today, as Abraham of old, acknowledges the absolute ownership of the child by God. He renounces all his illusory rights and urgent claims to the child. When the Kohen returns the child to the father and accepts the five shekels, he presents him on behalf of God with a new child. Something precious is re-entrusted to him. The dialectical drama of Mount Moriah, concludes Rabbi Soloveitchik, consisting in losing and finding a son is restaged in all its magnificence. After receiving the child from the Kohen, the father must always remain aware that it was only through God's infinite grace that this infant was returned to him in sacred trust. Abraham, after the Akedah, saw Isaac as this sacred trust. He knew that Isaac lives as we all do by God's grace. And we too are called to see all we have and all those we love in a similar manner, not as possessions of ours, but sources of obligation and sanctification. Rabbi Soloveitchik's letter, little known and published relatively recently, is one that bears in its wisdom a striking fact that perhaps one of the greatest rabbinical commentaries on the sacrifice of Isaac was penned by a rabbi in a letter to a Roman Catholic priest. And the letter's lesson is enduring. Our lives and those of our children are gifts of God. And this bestowal brings sacred responsibility. Rabbi Soloveitchik's remarkable exchange with this priest thus allows us to understand what took place in the temple daily. It is on Mount Moriah where the temple was situated, at the very place that Abraham bound Isaac, that the altar of the temple stood. It is at the very site of Abraham's original sacrifice of the ram where the animal sacrifices of all Israel eventually took place. To offer an animal at this site is not merely to give a gift to God. It is to reenact the original offering of the ram that took place right here. To offer an animal as Abraham once did is to re-experience in a primal way a ritual of redemption in the very same spot where so many centuries before Abraham's prayer was answered and a ram revealed in replacement of Isaac. Let us for a moment imagine a Jew entering this magnificent edifice in order to present an animal offering. The site has been greatly altered since the Akedah. Abraham ascended with Isaac all alone, whereas this Jew would join the throngs of thousands. But this Jew would be imitating his ancestors' ascent all the same. Before entering, he would remove his sandals, a reminder that this is where Abraham's encounter with the angel occurred, therefore endowing the site with sanctity. And when he stands before the altar with an animal, he may be barefoot, but he finds himself existentially in Abraham's shoes. He remembers again Abraham's prayer. The scene so exquisitely sketched by Rembrandt is imprinted upon this Jew's heart and soul and his ancestor's prayer echoes in his ears. God, provide us the ram. The animal is offered. God has provided the ram. And the Jew descends the mount transformed, existentially akin to Abraham returning from Mount Moriah. The sacrifice that the Jew has offered here at the very same site where Abraham once stood has not changed God. It has changed him. His attitude to life is altered. For this Jew now understands that every moment that he has and that his family has is, as it was for Isaac, a lease on life by the grace of God. Today, many assume that what took place at this very spot, first enacted by Abraham and then reenacted by his descendants, bears no relevance to our contemporary lives. They thereby miss how much it truly pertains to them today 
and how even in our day and age, one of our cherished rituals as Jews reminds us that we are called to see ourselves, like Abraham, as custodians of all that we have been bequeathed by God. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once described how he took Penelope Leach, one of Britain's most prominent child psychologists, to visit a Jewish primary school. There she witnessed children play-acting the rituals of the Shabbat meal that was about to take place that evening. Young boys blessed the wine, little girls kindled candles, and Sabbath songs were sung. Leach was struck by all that she saw, but one moment was particularly enthralling. The reenactment of a tradition that takes place in many Jewish homes, where right before the Sabbath meal begins, the father extends his hands to cover the heads of each of his children and blesses them. Penelope Leach, by Sachs reports, marveled as she witnessed, quote, the five-year-old mother and father blessing the five-year-old children with the five-year-old grandparents looking on, end quote. Leach left this school overcome by the centrality of family life to traditional Judaism. The ritual of Jewish parents blessing their children is indeed moving, but it is easily misconstrued. Rightly understood, it stresses first and foremost not the possessive bond between parent and child, but rather the connection between child and God. The standard form of showing love to our children is through an embrace. The act is possessive in nature, drawing them close to us. To bless our children by extending our hands is the opposite. Rather than drawing them close, we set them apart, indicating that they belong to someone other than ourselves. In the Bible, the one ritual comparable to the Jewish act of blessing is sacrificial in context, and it took place right here. The worshiper in the temple placed his hands on an animal's head before the ritual occurred, thereby renouncing his own claim to the offering and dedicating it to God. In a similar sense, to place one's hands on a child is to recall the temple and consecrate this child, consecrate him or her to divine service. The parallel between biblical blessing and temple ritual is rarely considered. But the Akedah that took place here is in a sense recreated every Friday evening in many Jewish homes all over the world where parents place their hands on their children's heads as their ancestors did over offerings in Jerusalem in the temple millennia ago. Can this be so? Can Jews for generations recall the Akedah and place the reenactment of this petrifying tale about parent and child at the heart of their most sacred familial experiences? They can indeed. For here too, Friday night, Jews illustrate to God that we see our children as Abraham after the Akedah saw his son. Not, of course, as ritual sacrifice, but rather as life gifted by God and thereby obligating us as parents to whom all is given in sacred trust. The Jewish thinker Leon Cass, commenting on the Akedah story, put it this way. Truth be told, he wrote, all fathers devote their sons to some god or other to mammon or Moloch, to honor or money, pleasure or power, or worse, to no God at all. True, he writes, they do so less visibly and less concentratedly, but they do so willy-nilly through the things they teach and respect in their own homes. They intend that the entire life of the sons be spent in service to their own ideals or idols. And in this sense, they do indeed spend the life of the children. But, Cass continued, a true father will devote his son to and will self-consciously and knowingly initiate him into only the righteous and godly ways. By showing his willingness to sacrifice what is his for what is right and good, he also puts his son on the proper road for his own adulthood, the true test of the good father. In this sense, at least, he is ever willing to part with his son as his son, recognizing him, as was Isaac, and as are indeed all children, as a gift and a blessing from God. It would seem then that rather than an anachronism, the Akedah, the origin story of the Temple Mount, speaks to us profoundly today. 
more than any other, ours is an age that has lavished love on children. They are coddled, cherished, and protected, denied nothing. Yet, as Senator Ben Sass has noted in a recent book, this has produced a generation of Americans locked in perpetual adolescence, a result of what Sass calls, quote, the creature comforts to which our children are accustomed, our reluctance to expose young people to the demand of real work, and the hostage-taking hold that computers and mobile devices have on adolescent attention, end quote. It is possible that today what we need is less embracing and more blessing, less parental possession and more parental consecration. We must consider, in other words, whether our children are seen by us as merely extensions of ourselves or whether we see them as given to us by God in sacred trust. Jews famously love life, cherish life, toast l'chaim to life. We do so because as descendants of Abraham and Isaac, we are exquisitely aware that life itself, the lives of ourselves and our children, are gifts of God given by his grace. The teaching of the tale of the Temple Mount lives today on Sabbath Eve in so many Jewish homes as parents reveal in reverence and love that the ability to bless our children is itself the greatest blessing of all. <laughs>